uh, but good evening, everyone. Um, and welcome to our, our event, um, a, which is a screening and a discussion of uh, When We Gather, uh, a film uh, by a, a famous artist who you're going to get to know, uh, hopefully sometime in, in the next few minutes. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Prashant Malvia. I'm a professor of marketing and senior associate dean of the MBA program. And I want to especially welcome all of our uh, students and, and alumni who are joining us uh, for this event which we are hosting as part of a, on a, an ongoing series uh, that we have labeled Operation Cura Personalis. As you know, Cura Personalis is the Latin for caring for the whole person. And the, ser the various events in this series are designed to bring our community together, uh, to heal each other, and, and to be as a support for each other. Uh, and, and when we gather the film and the concept is very much about the idea of, of gathering together as a community of, be, of being united and of being uh, in service to the, the common good. Before I hand over to um, uh, our, our panelists, I, I want to acknowledge the presence of uh, some of our, our colleagues here. Um, uh, I know we have uh, many of, of my team members from the MBA program, but also uh, faculty, staff, and colleagues from other parts of McDonough and the university. So thank you all for being here with us. Uh, I, I particularly want to call out uh, Professor Anita Gonzalez, who uh, you may have seen is uh, going to be part of the university's racial justice initiative. She is currently a professor at Michigan, but will be joining us soon uh, in, in the summer. So we are thrilled that, that she's joining us, but also equally delighted that she's here with us uh, today evening. Um, I want to uh, introduce uh, very briefly um, our, one of our alumna, Wendy Norris, uh, who has been featured in our 60 year celebration of women in the business school. Um, and I met Wendy, I think about three years ago during one of my trips to San Francisco. And uh, we had a, a lunch, uh, but I had heard and, and she explained to me that she runs an art gallery. And I walked through the streets of San Francisco, discovered her art gallery, and it was a traditional art gallery where there were uh, many pieces uh, that were on, on show. Um, but later on, I, I visited San Francisco again a year later and, and the art gallery was gone and all she had was a little room that was more like a storage of art. And that's when I discovered that Wendy was actually at the cutting edge of, of the arts uh, and, and using the, the experience of art as the key idea around which she was curating uh, her various artists. And, and this idea of curating art in spaces, in environments, in contexts where the art makes the most sense and brings out the best in all of us and in the art is really what we are going to experience today as well uh, in the screening of this film and in our conversation uh, with our artist Magda and with one of the producers of this film, Virginia Shaw. Uh, Wendy is, is an alumna of the MBA program from the class of 96. Uh, Wendy, welcome and over to you. Thank you so much, Prashant. I'm really happy to be here this evening. Uh, I'm gonna first introduce the film. Uh, it's five minutes and after the film, I'm going to be joined by Magda, Maria Magdalena Campos Pons, as she's formerly known, and uh, one of the film's producers, Virginia Shore in conversation, and I'll formally introduce them at that time. But I, I feel like I'm just gonna set the film up and we'll go from there. Um, what you're about to see is a five minute film that was basically given to Magda in a dream. And this dream uh, happened, to give, happened to have been given to her on the historic election of the first female vice president of the United States. And in Magda's original dream, there are a group of women, they're all dressed in suffragist white, dancing around the White House in a counterclockwise direction. And these women represent all ages and sizes and skin colors and a really beautiful meditative ritual. And in this ritual, it, it stemmed from a, a Yoruban tradition in her native Cuba uh, and in this ritual was originally performed by women to cleanse the house, to create a stronger pathword forward, a healthier, 
stronger future. So that is the genesis of this film. Uh, the day she had this dream, she called me and told me about the dream. It was the morning that uh, Biden and Harris had, uh, um, the networks had called for them. And prior to calling me, she called a dancer and choreographer and MacArthur genius, Okui Akwakpasili, an incredible soundscape artist and poet, Latasha and Nevada Diggs. She shared her dream with them and with me. And before you knew it, we decided to collaborate and they invited four more artists to join them. I then hired an incredible production team, including Virginia Shore, who you'll meet later. And I also hired an incredible uh, director out of Los Angeles, Cody Elaine Oliver, who happens to be a Howard University alum. And we made a film. It was clear to us that we were not going to be able to do this performance around the White House during a pandemic. So instead, we opted for the media of film. The film is five minutes long. We made it over the course of six weeks and across seven different locations. It was a Herculean effort for any of you out there listening that have had any experience in the film industry, you'll understand that. Um, so I look forward uh, to joining you all after you have a chance to witness this film and we get to talk about art and healing. Enjoy. Gary, are you playing the film? Yes. Oh, hold on. Can you see it, Prashant? Not yet. All right, that's, I know what's going on. Hold on. If you're having trouble sharing it, I can also share it as well. Um, it is. I've got it. I think I know what happened. Now, can you see it? No. Really? I, I can share the video. Please do. Thanks, Gordy. I don't know what's going on. We tested it before we got on. Are you able to see it? Yes. Maybe for when we gather Gathering the bows, strings of gold down our necks, borderless gather. gather. Maybe the red stitch was broken in the quilt, spiraling in storm feathered stars. She hard pressed herself to finish, toil the hair, the conjure of twirls didn't work, hiding prayer knots. Whispers always weave these roads in quite the same fashion. A delicate skip, hop, while the threads mean to open portals. Imagine necessary white ribbons onto ponytails, later adjusted with bangs. All this work to show we all equal before many routes. Still, we gotta have our moment. Mm -hmm. Maybe the suitcase in yellowed plastic bags upcycled did not burst at scenes. Maybe she good girl, please watch over her, 
pen to jacket was a prayer for us all. Didn't work for less, but might have. We had little and dreamt labyrinths, buckled dress shoes, quite the shiny marvel, black saffron socks, ankle and ruffled, a chorus chartered to school, imagine necessary a soup of new brown playmates. Did we understand that? Little girls, this work we knew little about was work. Only a child in a stitch of American moments. Maybe the charter was opposed. Gathered from blind complaints, made wards with treaties. She hardened hardly an understatement. A teacher's cruel ruler. How proper speech didn't work nor kill, tamed not. She remembers blood and clan, remembers her ocean, woodlands, quite the opposite. So make way, make way, fighters. Grand calabash matriarchs imagining necessary glory in tongues. The whistling air speaks. The house needs cleaning. This work that sullied means more work. Thus whisper gingerly, like cedar, like pine, on all moments. Gathering the cloth for skirts and locks, we mend our socks, unbind the clock, we gather, gather. Gathering the bows, strings of gold down our necks, borderless, gather, gather. Gathering the rings, those perfect dreams, gather your cradle boards, gather. Gather the what and how to hold on, work against the chill, the what and how to keep strong, work against the chill. Gathering the cloth for skirts and locks, we mend our socks, unbind the clock, we gather, gather. Is it back to me now? It is. Yes. Thank you. Um, I think I'm now joined by Maria Magdalena Campos Pons, who we affectionately call Magda, and Virginia Shore. Virginia? Uh, I'm going to introduce the two of you, and then I have some fun statistics for this business university minded crowd that I wanted to share before we delve into conversation. Is that okay? Okay. So, um, Magda is an internationally renowned artist and I don't wanna to promise too much Magda, but I, I do know this from firsthand after working with you now for four years that once someone meets you and hears you speak, that it's an indelible conversation. So she is pretty unforgettable for most people. Um, 
Her work is in dozens of collections and museums around the world, including um, MoMA in New York, and even the Smithsonian um, has several pieces of hers and Harvard University. Um, she's also um, makes paint, uh, paintings and drawings and photography, major installation works, in addition to performances like what you've seen uh, just now. She um, more recently did an incredible performance in Washington, DC, um, obviously referencing DC here because that's where a lot of our, our folks are gathered here tonight um, in DC for the National Portrait Gallery. It was, I believe, two years ago. And um, later this year, potentially early next, depending on, uh, depending on the publisher's timeline, uh, Dr. Nikki Green out of Wellesley College is writing an incredible book that focuses on three of the, the most important performance artists including Magda. And I think it's gonna give a lot of additional insight into um, the performative elements in her interdisciplinary practice. Um, I've been working with Magda for four years now. Uh, she's joining us tonight, um, I think in the middle of a tornado. She's based in Nashville, Tennessee, where she is the um, Cornelius Vanderbilt Chair at Vanderbilt University um, in their arts department. So. Welcome, Magda. Um, Virginia Shore, I've had the pleasure of knowing. In fact, I first met her at one of my favorite events ever in Washington, DC that she was hosting at the State Department for the Medal of Arts Award for Fine Arts. She was um, in charge of the Arts and Embassies Program for the, United, the um, US State Department for years. And you might have to correct me if I'm wrong, Virginia, but I think the number is 89, 89 American embassies that you've curated around the world. I cannot begin to, to I, thought, I thought the production of When We Gather was challenging. Uh, I can't imagine what, what that might've been like. Um, I uh, have had the pleasure of working with Virginia and was excited that she, um, after she wrapped up some get out the vote and activist projects with, within the arts field. She was able to join us as a producer and uh, she's based in DC typically, um, but today she's joining us from um, a much deserved spring break that we've pulled her away from down in South Carolina. Um, Virginia is currently curating some uh, very, very important collections around the US. Um, not least of which is the Obama Foundation that she's already been working on for two years. So I'm looking forward to hearing about um, her approach to curation, especially as it, result, as it relates to healing. So I did a little research, or I should say, um, one of the producers on the When We Gather team did some research for me around um, art and healing. Um, I was amazed at how much um, is out there. Uh, being Having been in the arts now for about two decades, I've always known it was uh, something that was a calling for me and, and have seen firsthand how arts can be healing and trying to think about this amazing program that Georgetown University and the business school is putting forth called Cura Personalis. I just wanted to ground our conversation just a second with a couple of quotes and some statistics for those uh, statistical people in the audience. Um, the National Endowment for the Arts, also based in DC, over the past decade has allocated specific funds, upwards of million $5 million, just for arts projects that are focused on healing. They've done a lot of analysis on the impact of those healings around different age groups, whether it's children or adults or people suffering depression. And so they continue to raise money and actively donate, um, not surprisingly. And there are around, just by a cursory research, probably 25 to 30 organizations of a pretty significant level that are just focused on arts and healings in this country. Um, one of my favorite quotes is from uh, UCSF out here where I'm based in San Francisco. I'm a little biased, but I do think it's one of the top, if not the top research on health and uh, well-being in the country. Their executive director of UCSF's 
Art for Recovery program says this. Her name is Teresa Allison. I think the beauty of the arts is that we are whole person engagements. They are whole person engagements. When we are looking at a painting, singing in a choir, or going to the theater, we're engaging not just our intellect, but our hearts. And in that moment of being transported by the artistic experience, this is a whole person experience. Seemed pretty appropriate for the conversation tonight. And, and I promised Prashant I would, I would use some of my statistical uh, um, market research, uh, tap back into that from my business school experience. Um, the American for the Arts, Americans for the Arts, which is a large organization that I have a lot of respect for, just did a market research study at the beginning of 2021. It's on their, on their website. Um, and these numbers are pretty staggering. 72% of Americans believe that arts, the arts unify our communities regardless of age, race, and ethnicity. And additionally, 73% of Americans believe that the arts help them to understand other cultures better. So we're at this inflection point in our country and in our homes, given what we've all been going through this last year. And those numbers are pretty compelling uh, given the amount of people they surveyed. So my first question is this, um, just that our audience just saw the film. You know, how does when we gather, whether we're talking about the film itself or all the activations and screenings we've been doing so far, how, how does that address healing? How does this piece address healing? And I want both Magda and Virginia to answer it from your respective viewpoints, one from a curatorial production standpoint, and you, Magda, maybe start first from the creation standpoint. Thank you, Wendy, and good evening to the audience joining us tonight. Uh, I am in gratitude to you all for inviting us to bring this program and this particular project to your campus. So I want to say thank you for that. And in addressing you all too, I want to express gratitude to the ancestral habitat, inhabitant of this land where I am staying here in Nashville, Tennessee. And, and I want to ask for permission to the spirit presence to address you and to my ancestors who too as well guides me. Um, sometime when we talk about art and we the artists that make art thinking about our role as witness, uh, we get ourselves uh, butterflies in the stomach I, for instance, has butterflies right now. I talk quite often uh, in many places, in many forums, but every single time that I do, I get butterflies because I am going to open myself a little bit to you and trying to express truth and communicate exactly what I feel, what I experience, how did I arrive to the moment and the point of this conversation. A few minutes ago was a big wind passing through the city in a small tornado crossing. And as I was getting ready to speak with you and running to look at the windows and be sure that my song is well, I was thinking tornadoes are both a moment of panic and a complete moment of cleansing. They too take away maladies and air that is impure. And when they left, even with destruction, they left behind some kind of past and some kind of cleansing. So in, when we gather, we wanted to create a tornado. Uh, we wanted to create a passing wind that removed all that was unnecessary, all that was contaminated. And it may be bring fear and shaking, but it was after it all passed, a space with transparency and a starting point for something new. I didn't make this image myself. It was an image that, as Wendy mentioned, 
it was given to me. I was dreaming for the people that are in the audience who are doctors or psychologists or therapists or all of that. They know exactly the state of dreaming and the realness or unrealness that dream is. But dreams, as well as our fear and our sense of witness, work in our guts. I learned and I know by now, after the year of practice, that almost everything that I think that comes to my brain and for my brain is reverse coming from my guts or the way passing through my heart and to the top of the house over there. So healing, I think, that is one of the more fundamental, straightforward, and maybe obscure manifestation of the power of art. Uh, my grandmother in Cuba was a healer. They call it in Spanish, curandera. Curandera is a word very close to curadora or curato. Both of them going out in the world to find things dislocated, trying to understand their meaning, trying to understand the truth and make them in a way clear or at least accessible for others to reach and to understand. That is the work that we artists do. We deal with things that are seen and unseen and through our own pain, to our own guts, we find our way to bring imagery in whatever form, I, from visual image to other, uh, to put it into materiality. So the most complex and for me challenging, uh, challenging aspect of the making is how to convey and how to turn into accessible materiality for the senses, for the receiver, for the beholder, for you all, those things that I feel, think, that affect me, and from what I am only um, a filter, a conduit, like being sleeping and receiving a dream of women dancing around the White House because the house needed a cleaner. The house needed a cleaning. The country needed a cleaning. The site itself needed a renewal, needed a kind of a, a stimulation of energy to bring newness. That is art in whatever form. In this case, in this particular case, is in this small movement of women moving country clothes wise and trying to become each one of them, they own a litter tornado, they own litter centrifugal force to bring renewal or to bring hope or a new spirit of believing, a new sense of possibilities, because this is what we're trying to create, a space of possibility. So how are here? It here to, to trust, to empathy, to proximity, to when you yourself has the little butterflies in your belly, that is the same butterfly that I get in my belly, but we don't share the butterfly, but we share the sensation. When you get your butterfly, you are getting something that is good for you. And when I get my butterflies, we both are connected in the sense of feeling that goodness, that energy, that understanding and a sense of a discovering. If we discover something, see it is open for us one single window, there's something that we then knew is working, I think. Thank you, Magda, thanks. <laughs> Good luck for following that, Virginia. <laughs> Impossible. <laughs> but I would love to hear, you know, from your perspective, you know so much about this project. What for you, given all your experience, is the most healing about it? Not only maybe personally for you, but what, what do you feel like is healing about this project? I uh, will thank you everyone for joining and thank you, Wendy, for including me and, and Prashant and Kelly. It's great to meet the entire team. and. This is impossible to follow you, Magda. <laughs> um, but let me, let me say this. Uh, when Wendy first reached out to me to tell me about Magda's vision, um, it really took me 
I, pro I was excited Im immediately, but it, I needed to really think about it. And I, I too live in, well, I'm not in Washington, DC right now, but I live in Washington, DC. So um, I think a lot of the audience that probably lives near Washington, DC or around. So we all know what was happening around this time. I mean, it was um, intense. The environment was intense. There was a lot of fear. There was anxiety. There were a lot of unknowns. And so hearing this vision that Magda had and you know, there was COVID and there is COVID and Magda was trying to figure out a way in the team of how to realize her vision with all these constraints around people coming together. And the original vision was all these women coming together, not just, I mean, it was open beyond women, but all these, the focus was women, women of all colors, of all races, sizes, as, as, as Wendy described in white and this procession with dance and this idea going back to the healing of everyone coming together and being close in this time of COVID, in this time of separation, in this time to think of something that would be joyful, that gives you human connection, that makes you feel part of something and change and also amidst like all the Black Lives Matters, all the racial issues and um, concerns that we all have in trying to change the world and make it better and wrong the rights or right the wrongs. It just felt like this incredible opportunity. And I don't know if sage burning was ever the term that was used, but in my mind, that was something that I held on to Magda. I think it was there of these women encircling, you know, the grounds of the White House and then in a procession. And I know in our heads, we got to a point of thinking we would also march up to the vice president's residence to celebrate the first female vice president and woman of, co woman of color and all the incredible excitement that that, you know, brought to the table as well and hope and hope and all these things were happening. Nothing was for sure at the time of this vision, of course. I, I think um, there were certain things we couldn't work around. We knew who was coming into the White House and we knew who was coming into the vice president's house. So change, change was there and it just felt like it was worth it. Like we could wear our masks, we could all be together, but for all the obvious reasons, it couldn't happen that way. Um, but I'm convinced this is just the beginning. So this beautiful film that was incredible, um, the Herculean efforts of all the team, but especially the performers and the, not the producers, but the, the director and making it happen across the United States and a few weeks pulling it off. Um, every time I watch that film, it makes me cry. So there is some, <laughs> something about it that clearly, no matter how many times I've seen it, elicits a feeling of connection. And with connection, there is healing and there is recognition. I think we all yearn to be seen. And that's this piece brings, I think it brings it all to the table. So I can't, I, I can't follow you, Magda, but no, <laughs> that's what yeah. I see. <laughs> Virginia, that was so beautiful. And, and one, one scene that maybe I add to that, uh, the film brought many people out of isolation and out of the despair of being for so many months through the pandemic into this energy of rebirth. We all gain again uh, the, pot the potentiality of doing. So it was something um, really beautiful and we were forced to create art all the time as we were preparing to this, to, to film in every one of our encounters and every one of our conversations uh, online in Zoom. So it was um, a important and I, I think the invitation for the public to create their own venues to create their own 
circularity to create their own when we gather because this is what we it was a call to action it was a, is you finish seeing this film now get the women get your people and create this sense of unity and this sense of proximity and of possibility and of possibility i think that that is a healing uh, aspect of it yeah i you know, I think it's worth noting um, that all the people that we hired, mo not everyone, but most people were in the, in the arts economy, which was virtually shut down this last year and continues to be. So we were able, it was healing just by able, being able to hire people, pay people, women a great wage for doing what they do. So that, I mean, for me was a personally healing thing. I think we all felt good about it. But also knowing so far in that we're screening across the country, if you go onto the whenwegather.org website, you see a map of all the places that we're screening it right now. I mean, it's all across the country in film festivals and museums. And um, I think that it's palpable um, that people want something like this. You know, but for this audience um, at Georgetown, which isn't sort of our you know, art um, speak audience. I mean, I think it's worth maybe just calling out Magda, a few of the, the, um, the symbols and actual physical parts of it that represent healing. I'm just thinking of like the color of saffron or the, the counterclockwise motion. Can you speak to why those choices um, are healing in and of themselves? Well, Thank you, Wendy, for reminding me all of that. I mean, uh, the, there are seven women in the film and we were trying to point out uh, directionality and the fact that everyone, we all in the planet species, we work with the cardinal point west is south, north, and then above, below, and center. So it was this very important that I saw uh, in a dream, the White House as a as a clock, and the women were participating. This is this idea of timing, but moving country crosswise in traditional Yoruba tradition is being talking back to your ancestral line. It's going to combat and and recover and understanding your path as you move forward. So for me, that was a, a very beautiful signaling of of possibility and potentiality. The color blue. It's a color. It's a color that brings unity and fraternity and a maternal and kind of a healing quality because it's the color of the goddess of the ocean uh, in in Yoruba tradition. So I, I in using the the blue ribbon, this is something that I was seeing this woman passing this line of blue and saffron around this White House that people were calling the people house and walking uh, toward them the same idea of a uh, dancer and choreographer, performer artist, Okuya Pukawasili, the, the tornado is the spinning of the energy, renewal and, and bringing, you know, a sense of a potentiality to a stagnation. When you move as a, in a tornado, a, a, a spin, a stagnation is dying, it's over, it's, it's just possibility, it's dynamism. So they are very, very specific symbols. And we, they are in, in the group of the women that we were together. They come in from all different of ethnicities and, and age and forms. So we have a Native American, South American, uh, African from the continent, uh, white women from this attent attentive looking to how plural we are and how only in the understanding and embracing of our plurality, uh, we could come together and we could do, we could make sense that in that plurality, plurality the butterfly, the, the surprise happened to everyone in the same spot, no? So we would, we, we try to, 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 to highlight and to wake, wake up, wake up, those uh, those energy and the simplicity the simplicity of acknowledging our present in a space and in time and this is what for us so important to locate the piece in sight 
We are in New York. We are in Massachusetts. We are in Nashville. We are in, we are in, 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 in not in California because we couldn't uh, enter California in the pandemic, but we are in Houston. So we are, we were traversing at the same time in a really rush against time through the country to capture this simple gesture of women connecting to each other, even when they are separated by great geography, because they are following the same motion, the same dynamic, the same direction, the same timing. When the field starts, you see every woman, they move in from six to three, to 12, to nine, to six, to three, to 12, to nine, and it's, it's simple magic of the drama and the ritual of living. After all, a six to three to 12 to nine is no different than wake up, go through your day, sleep, come back again, do it again, do it again, and mark it. We're trying to stretch that and show it. That in, and then when we stretch that, is our desire being here and departing and coming back again in that circularity, in that tornado, in that continuum uh, of, of idea. I, I think uh, I was dreaming that we could be together in Washington and I was thinking, should I dream this? It's a, it's a possibility. So what I, what I aim now is to see the women, many women one day, in the near future, all together, dancing and walking and singing and in, in the city of, of Washington around the White House. And it's one more scene that the film could not bring to you, but it was so important uh, for me and for the women that we're working to, together. Smell, we wanted to bring a perfume to Washington. This dream for me have a smell. It have a particular smell that was of course, delicious, fantastic. And this is what we talk about sage because I smell, and I was thinking every one of us, we want to literally give this city for a moment an, a sense of purity, beauty, new, something that the city have not seen. That is healing because we know if we could smell it, if we could sense it in, in ourselves, and it's good and it's restorative. That precise moment already is a healing moment. So I want all of you in the audience to close your eye for a second and smell a fresh fragrance around the city of Washington where you are. Close your eye for a second and smell something that you don't know, but is good for you. Try. For me, it's refreshing. It's wonderful. I, I have tornado image in my mind. So for me, it's something like a fresh, fresh spring coming around. So thank, thank you, Magda. Um, yeah, I think the blue, the colors, the choices, the movements, even the way Cody filmed things in a slow motion and um, showing uh, Okui's daughter at the end is also sort of a healing saying that we have healed and we're creating this better future for our children. Um, you know, Virginia, you and I've talked about this a little bit, but with all of the curation that you've done and when you're embarking on a project, I, I know a lot of what you're doing oftentimes is around diplomacy, which is uh, very, very, uh, uh, specific at times and not, but I'm curious how you think about art uh, as a connect and connection or healing or how um, you approach the notion of healing intentionally or not when you're embarking on projects. Um, well, I, I think where I would start in the response is sort of what brought me there was my work at the State Department. Um, and it was very specific. Um, in 1998, 
um, when the bombings happened in Tanzania, when our embassy in Tanzania and our embassy in Kenya were both bombed, Congress mandated that about more than three quarters of our embassies and consulates around the wor world be rebuilt for security reasons. And in two, and I had been at the department for many years, the program had been around, has been around next year, it will be six, the 60th anniversary of art and embassies. And it was all about borrowing American art and, and exhibiting the artist's work in the ambassador's residences. So after jump forward to the bombings and having to rebuild um, embassies around the world, um, in 2000, I was having conversation with some of the architects at the State Department and we agreed um, that they would allow me to do three pilot projects of three new brand new embassies and what art might be able to do in this public space of an embassy and it had never there had never been a program for it officially before and no acquisitions were ever made through the art and embassies program before so in moscow in yerevan armenia and in istanbul um, those were the first three projects that i curated and i was able to convince them to allow me to work with local artists in addition to american and previously it was only american art and i studied cross-cultural exchange. I studied statistics on the difference between exchange and cross-cultural exchange when you're, it's two-way, when you're actually acknowledging the culture of another country as well as your own. Um, and for a long time, clearly, you know, there wasn't as much cross-cultural exchange happening at the State Department, but they opened the door and allowed us to do it and it changed everything. It changed everything. We were acknowledging their artistic heritage. We were acknowledging their artists. We were building, and, and over time, the more, I, the more projects that I worked on and curated, the stronger I became, the more confident I became. And also like the ability to go monumental and bring in artists from both countries to start collaborations, mosaics and Dakar. I worked with Mickling, Th Thomas and Pinyang. I've worked with thousands of artists and I can't tell you how they almost across the board have all embraced the idea of not only, it didn't, it wasn't always exchanges that way, but of together being in spaces and to having conversations and to it, wanting to understand the culture of that country and to address something in that country that resonates. So I think the most um, gratifying moments and I, ha I had was when I would be installing and working through years of, of planning for a new embassy and then seeing two thirds of our staff and then any embassy is actually from the country, from the host country is seeing um, the people who work in the embassy and people come into the embassy and see their artists on our walls and feeling acknowledged, feeling the desire for that olive branch that's being extended to them and realizing that, you know, it's not just about flying the American flag, it's actually about building the relationships with the people in this country. And, you know, the embassy's walls got bigger and bigger with these as a result of those bombings. And so it was less and less possibility to get into these buildings. So the art really became this key connection and it's been written about. And I think the post said for a while, the embassies were all one foot, one plan. Um, so the architecture was really an issue, um, but they called the art, the lipstick on the pig. <laughs> For a while, when the when before they allowed serious architects to get involved and not just have one standard embassy design, um, but art was this healing force and a connector, and you know it continues to be and always will be. And as your statistics that you referenced from Americans in the Arts um, confirm, it it really does transport people and open people's minds and. Um, and allow people to see things differently. And it, in the embassies at open conversations, I have so many examples of conversation starters with artworks that the ambassadors and the lead diplomats would defer to the works and use those works as ways to open conversations. So 
sorry, that was sort of a long, and that work, you know, I left the department in, in the end of 17 and um, it's definitely informed the work that I do now and um, the partners that I have and what I hope, you know, my favorite projects are those projects where you actually feel, you feel this connection, but you also feel like you're sometimes addressing issues and bringing other perspectives to it and bringing creative energy into it, like this project, right? Yeah, I think that's great. I, I didn't know the story in your background, all that story about the the formation and, and the bombings and how it all came to be. So that's that's pretty important. Um, yeah. yeah, wow. Um, I think we only have a handful of minutes left in our program. I think we're gonna try to do a stop in about 10 minutes. So if anybody has a question out there, just send it through to the Q&A and we'll try to pick it up. Um, before I go on to um, a, a couple more questions before we wrap, I did wanna say um, a few housekeeping things. I would be remiss if I didn't. Um, we are screening this project around the country right now. And I think for me, in terms of healing, it has always been to try to unite this country um, that's been increasingly polarized for different reasons. And so when I see our map and different pins of all the places it's screening, um, we ask you to just follow us on the website and on Instagram at, uh, at when we gather art. Um, we, uh, Magda is also, um, if you wanna learn more about her work, it's on my gallery's website, gallerywendynorris.com. But Magda, when you were speaking and you keep bringing up butterflies, I can't help but saying this, um, there's a really powerful um, exhibition opening next month at the Speed Museum in Louisville, Kentucky. And it's, um, it's dedicated to the memory of Breonna Taylor. And it's just a blue chip uh, roster of artists that have made new work contributing to Brianna. Um, her mother actually worked closely with the curators at the Speed Museum. And it's really a show all about healing that community, which was incredibly, um, uh, torn apart during a really, really um, trying time in this country. And uh, Magda made a wonderful uh, new piece uh, called Butterfly Eyes uh, for Brianna Taylor. It's a, uh, it will be on view. Um, I think last week, the New York Times did a really big piece on, on, the, on the project. And again, it's just a testament to how um, the museum there at, the, uh, at Louisville is, is really trying to use art to unify that community. I mean, I can't think of no better example in present time than that. Um, so I don't know, Magda, if there's any last words you wanna say before we sign off um, to, to our audience out there or, or Virginia, I'll just leave it at that. Well, I want to, I want just to say one more scene about art and healing. Uh, Art bring knowledge and disperse knowledge is a tool for accessing new information and information that is um, that contain the vitality of the truth of the maker of the artist as as I say in the beginning bear witness of their time uh, it take for the artist to talk of their time, take courage and it's painful, but also is a tool that could allow others to enter and get proximity. So what I am saying here is the dispersing of art, the literacy that arts bring to people is a tool that reinforce our own experience as a species, and is one that brings freedom. Art is a vehicle for freedom and to freedom through the knowledge and the dexterity and the agency the art allowed the makers and the receivers. Art is a tool for freedom. That I want to say. 
That's beautiful. Uh, I did. I do have one question, and then we're gonna. It's a question. I think Virginia is gonna have to answer, but. Um, it's a question that you and I love is, did the vice president see this film? <laughs> it is a million dollar question or a billion dollar question. You know, I'm sitting in California. She was my district attorney, my attorney general and senator. And I've known her since before her first election and have been a big, big champion of hers from day one but she no longer has a cell phone that she used to have. Um, and uh, so in, we have talked to everybody we know around her. Is that fair to say, Virginia? Yeah, that's fair. I don't know that she's seen it. What do you What do you think? What are the odds? I I believe she's seen it, yeah. and I believe that if we were further into this administration, that there would have been in a time to be able to do it, but the focus all had to be on the issues that they're covering right now, right? If you look at the post, but I know, I believe she's seen it and I believe she knows how important this piece is. That's what I believe. So on that note, I'm gonna throw it over to Prashant to close, but I would say to all the folks in the Georgetown community and everybody out there, um, if we uh, have our way, we're going to end up performing this live in DC, um, come hell or high water in 2022. <laughs> so I can't, I can't tell you everything we have on deck, but maybe, maybe we can get our vice president to, to do some spiral tornadoes <laughs> with us. That would be yes, amazing. Yes. <laughs> we can certainly put in a word with our uh, second husband. Uh, given that he's now a faculty at Georgetown University. <laughs> but, but thank you all so much. Uh, this, is, uh, this was an amazing conversation, uh, very inspirational. Uh, you know, see uh, all of you, especially the, the entire team, uh, Wendy, that you put together of all the women uh, and, and the amazing work that you have pulled off. Uh, it's truly inspirational for all of us that you know, we can all do our little bits to help us gather, that we can all do our little bit to unite uh, and, and come together. Uh, and so thank you for, for sharing your image, your, your, your inspiration uh, with us. Um, before I, I sign off, I do want to uh, uh, acknowledge a few of my colleagues who I see uh, who are uh, with us today. Um, first, I want to uh, give a shout out to one of our student leaders. She was our vice president of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, Simmer Graywell. Thank you for being with us, Simmer. I uh, also want to uh, 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 shout out, give a shout out to uh, my colleague, Michael O'Leary, who is the, the chair of our McDonough Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion uh, Initiative. So thank you, Michael, for being here with us. And also Michael is the curator of uh, the, the book that uh, honors 60 years of women at the business school. And given that this is Women History Month and, and the team that is doing this work, uh, this was a perfect fit for, for the work that Michael has done and the work we want to promote. And finally, I want to uh, uh, acknowledge the presence of uh, Rosemary Kilkenny, who is uh, the university's chief diversity officer. So Rosemary, thank you very much for being here. Uh, you know, hopefully you will be able to uh, join in a conversation maybe offline uh, with Wendy, Magda and, and, uh, and Virginia. With that, uh, thank you very much all for joining us. Uh, thank you, Wendy. Thank you, uh, Magda. And thank you, Virginia. Uh, thank you, Kerry and, and the team for helping us put this together. Um, have a wonderful evening, everyone. <laughs>